Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a link. Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and the menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenter at the end of the talk. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button once to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noise. Today's slides are now available on our site at cider.athabascau.ca and a full recording will be posted about an hour after the session ends. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March session of the 2018-19 CIDR session series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. For today's session, we're pleased to have two of our most popular voices and consistent supporters of CIDR, Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte, with the latest installment in our ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning. Michael Barbour is Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Truro University, California in Vallejo, California. He has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. His research focuses on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 online learning, particularly for students located in rural jurisdictions. And in recent years, he has advocated for policies designed to promote effective forms of K-12 online and blended learning. Randy Labonte, has served as a senior level executive for over 30 years in the education sector. He was the lead consultant for seven years at the BC Ministry of Education, involved in field work leading to the development of policy, agreements, and e-learning standards. He helped develop, pilot, and implement the quality review process for BC online K-12 schools, and is now the chief executive officer for the Canadian e-learning network and teaches in the Online Learning and Teaching Diploma Program for Vancouver Island University, as well as in the Can eLearn Online Teacher PD Program. He is passionate about online and technology-supported blended learning. I'm now passing the microphone to Michael and Randy. Everyone welcomes Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. Thank you, Dan. Um, so just to give you, I guess, a, a little overview of what Randy and I plan on doing today. Um, basically for the first 20 minutes to 25 minutes I suspect I'm going to go through sort of a formal update on uh, what's happening across the country in the K-12 environment and um, while I will try to keep an eye on the chat Randy will do most of the uh, monitoring of the, the chat window and then about halfway through we're actually going to shift because as this is an annual um, study that we do every year, most folks or many of the folks in the room are quite familiar with the results from year to year, so oftentimes it's just a matter of updating a few differences that we've seen throughout the country with a little bit of nod to the novices in the room and then we'd like to engage in a conversation with folks here to be able to uh, see what's happening in your part of the country as well as uh, entertain any questions that you've got. So um, that's sort of, uh, I guess, how we're, we're setting this up uh, this morning, just to give you uh, that little bit of an overview. So um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Michael Barber, and my colleague is Randy Labonte, and 
Uh, we've been working on this report now for, I think it's five or six years that Randy joined me as a, um, uh, a formal co-author. But uh, as you can see, this is actually the 11th year that we've been doing this report. And uh, it's uh, as I was listening to Dan's introduction, I thought to myself, this is, I think, the 22nd year that I've been involved with K-12 distance online and blended learning. And I've spent half of that time actually involved in this annual study. Um, so it's um, uh, just looking at, as I was putting this, sl this slide together this morning, it, it uh, struck me as to, to how long we've actually been doing this. Um, before I get into the formal part of the presentation, I actually do want to thank the sponsors that we have, because in all honesty, um, while we have been doing this for 11 years, without them, basically, we would likely give this enterprise up. Um, uh, it is a significant undertaking each year, and the, the sponsorship that these folks provide, both uh, monetary and in many cases in-kind sponsorship. Um, so folks like Open School BC, who do all of the copy editing and publishing of this year's report, uh, the Manitoba First Nations Educational Resource Center, who are actually right now in the process of publishing, uh, doing the copy editing and actually formatting of the 2017 French version of the report. Um, Canny Learn has been a great partner with us for the last uh, six years. Uh, Learn in Quebec as well as uh, CFED in Alberta, uh, both uh, are annual sponsors and do a tremendous job and tremendous amount of work on the translation of the report each year. Uh, I specifically want to mention that because for the last two years, and if you go back on the website, all of the 2016 profiles that we've got there have all been translated into French, and it's largely been through the in-kind work that uh, Michael Canuel and, and Jean Monglin um, with CFED and LEARN, or I guess LEARN and CFED respectively, uh, have done for us. So we thank them a great deal for that. Uh, Folks like VHS and uh, the BCTF have been longtime sponsors of us, and we were uh, pleased to welcome the Vista Virtual School this year as a first-time sponsor. Um, if you're not familiar with the website for the report, and we obviously, as you can see, since we've now released the 11th report, we have to update our banner again. Um, but uh, you can access the report both on a granular level as well as the complete report on our website there, which is k12sotn, or state of the nation, .ca. And so if you click on the research or research reports link there, you'll get links to all of the annual reports, as well as right now two special topic reports that we've done over the last couple of years. And we have a third one that's coming out um, probably in the next month or so that's looking at what Canadian universities are doing uh, at least what their teacher education programs are doing with respect to preparing uh, both in-service and pre-service teachers for the K-12 distance online and blended environment. Um, if you don't want to sort of review the complete report, uh, you can just click on the data and information and it'll take you to a map of the country where you can just zero in specifically upon what's happening in an individual jurisdiction. Um, so that's quite useful. And as you can see on the far right-hand side there, the Enfance link, uh, which, as I mentioned, was largely provided by the uh, work uh, of Michael and Jean and their teams. So just to, to give you a sense of where the information comes from on an annual basis, uh, over the last 11 years, we've been reaching out to the uh, ministries or departments of education for each of the uh, 10 provinces, three territories, as well as in 2013, we started involving uh, the federal government to get that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, uh, Inuit perspective. And um, as you can see there, over that period of time, the information has come from a variety of sources. Um, earlier years, it was primarily key stakeholders or our own document analysis from printed and online materials. But as you can see, uh, starting really in about 2011 or so, we've been consistently getting information from the ministries uh, when appropriate. And in most years, they tend to be our primary source. And even in years where they're listed as our only, in all honesty, it's not the only source. It's just where we get most of the information from. Um, 
The other source of information that we get um, in many cases, and you can see from this chart here, it varies from year to year. But um, we have an individual program survey that we send out to, um, this past year it was about 270 programs, that's gone up to 283 I think was the most we ever sent them out to. Uh, typically from year to year we'll get anywhere from 15 to about 26, 28 percent of the programs that will provide us with updated program level material. Um, if we were to look at a historical account and uh, account for or count all of the programs that have responded at least once, uh, we have heard from about half of the um, e-learning programs that have existed throughout Canada um, at least once, and most of them, in all honesty, um, or at least about 15%, I should say, uh, respond every year. And then we usually get another 6 to 10% that respond um, from time to time. So between those various sources, that's sort of how we put together this, this overview. So for those of you that are, are novices to the area, or this is the first time that you've sat through one of these sessions, um, to give you a quick sense as to what the country looks like right now, um, when you look at the nature of programs across the country, you can usually put them together in one of two sort of um, categories, either ones that are run directly at the provincial level or uh, oftentimes directly by the ministry themselves, or ones that are run at the... Um, district level or have more of a district focus. And in some cases, that's not a single district. It might be multiple districts. Um, so you've got the red provinces there, which are mainly Atlantic Canada, are the ones where you have single provincial programs. Uh, you have the blue provinces that are mainly um, district-based programs. And then you've got some purple ones there, which have a combination of the two. So I, I see uh, Jean and Michel from CFED in the room. Um, Alberta is actually a good example of, of this because while there are about 20 to 22, I'm going to Daylene's in the room so she can give me the exact number now, um, district-based programs, you also have programs like CFED and like the Alberta Distance Learning Center that um, operate on a provincial level. So that's where you get that um, purple color that you've got there. The fourth color that you see on the map is, is a green color, and those are ones that primarily use programs from other jurisdictions. So basically, it's northern Canada as well as Prince Edward Island. Um, although you'll see Yukon and the Northwest Territories are striped, and that's because they have um, their own programs that are in current development. Um, it's, I suspect, in the 2019 report, we're going to have to come up with a fifth color for the map um, or at least use one of the uh, probably red ones for Northwest Territories in the Yukon because those programs are starting to move from pilot to um, actual programs that they've decided that these are this is the way in which they're going to invest. So um, just to, to provide, a, I guess, a region-by-region region look, and I'll just do about 30 seconds per slide here. Um, but as I mentioned, the three Atlantic Canadian provinces, they're all single province-wide programs. Um, in the case of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, they're run directly by the ministry. And New Brunswick is actually a little misleading because it's actually two province-wide programs, uh, one Anglophone and one Francophone. Uh, in the case of Newfoundland, uh, it is a single province-wide program, but it's actually run by the school district. Uh, but Newfoundland is kind of unique in that respect because it only has a single school district for the entire province. So uh, while it is a single program, it's not run by the ministry itself. And then Prince Edward Island actually uses distance ed programs from New Brunswick. They've stopped using their own uh, or stopped developing their own and have for the last five or six years just been using New Brunswick's. In the case of Quebec and Ontario, um, Quebec were an interesting case, and I'll get into this a little bit in the regulation, but they, um, for really a couple of decades, at the provincial level, got out of the business of distance education altogether. So you had several individual programs, in some cases responsible for a single district, in some cases they are... Um, separate entities like LEARN, 
that work with several districts, in the case of Learn, it's Anglophone districts. Um, you've got a provincial-wide correspondence program in SOFED that uh, works primarily with students that have dropped out or adult students. Um, you know, so it's it's a probably, I guess, like you could say about Quebec in many respects, it's it's a unique jurisdiction when it comes to its e-learning across the country. Um, Ontario is sort of the exact opposite. They probably have one of the more structured systems. Um, so you have a centralized unit called eLearning Ontario that uh, provides a learning management system, provides course content, uh, provides a student information system, and then individual districts maintain their own distance uh, or online programs, um, e-learning programs. The ministry even provides a single individual or a TELC, uh, technology-enabled learning coordinators, is I think the current label, although they change every couple of years. Um, they were DELCs for a while, and I think there was some other term that they used before that. Um, but uh, so each of the districts maintains its own program. And then some of the districts have decided to collaborate in these consortiums uh, to essentially optimize their excess capacity so that they weren't wasting resources. As we move over into Western Canada, we sort of go flip back and forth in terms of, of the colors. So Saskatchewan is actually kind of like Quebec in that they used to have a centralized system, got out of the business of distance education and devolved it to the districts. So you can see it's just district based now. Uh, there are about 15 or 16 programs that are currently in operation. Uh, BC is similar to that in that um, there are memory serves about 60 public, actually just under 60 public programs, and I think it's around 15, 14 uh, private programs right now, uh, or independent programs that are operating. And while they operate at the district level, uh, because the funding follows the student in British Columbia, uh, in many cases, their distance enrollment comes from out of district. Um, I mentioned Alberta before uh, when I was looking at the national one, and Manitoba is sort of in the same boat. They have a couple of province-wide legacy programs. One is a television one. Uh, the other one is a... Um, Sorry, um, my kittens have distracted me here as I'm going through. Um, so uh, one of the programs that they've got is a, a legacy television program, an ITV program that operates at the provincial level. They've also been engaging in these virtual collegiates, which are pilot programs that they've been looking at, um, where they've allowed district-based programs to essentially operate on a provincial level. Uh, so they've been piloting that over the last two or three years. Uh, looking at northern Canada, uh, in the case of Northwest Territories and Nunavut, they um, mainly utilize programs coming out of Alberta, primarily ADLC, although in Nunavut they are also using some of the Contact North programming that's coming out of Ontario. Um, the programs in the Yukon are actually are probably the most varied, I should say. There is a ministry-based blended program. There is a territorial-wide virtual school that is uh, just coming out of pilot phase. And then they still also use uh, distance programs from British Columbia, primarily the Northern British Columbia Distance Education School. Um, the Northwest Territories also has a um, program that actually grew out of the district-based one that was in the Beaufort Delta uh, region, and that's now looking as a territory-wide um, initiative. So as I mentioned, those will probably turn red or some new color uh, looking ahead um, into the future. So I mentioned earlier about the, the nature of regulation, and it really is sort of all across the board when you're looking at what's happening across the country. Uh, you can usually group them into one of these four items, although you'll see many jurisdictions use multiple versions of these. Uh, so to use Alberta, or sorry, Ontario as an example, 
Um, Ontario has a strict policy handbook uh, that's about 100 pages or so, 70 pages, um, that um, outlines here's all the things that you should or must do if you're participating in the provincial online program. And then each of the districts that do that actually have to sign a service agreement stating that they will abide by this particular document. Um, so, you know, a very structured kind of regime, but not a legislative regime. Um, the legislation items there are kind of misleading because if you look at it, you'll see that the vast majority of jurisdictions have some form of legislation that governs distance education. Um, in fact, it's the most common form. The, and I say it's misleading because with the exception of Nova Scotia and British Columbia, for the most part, the legislation that references distance education basically just has usually a single statement in there that says distance education programs shall be regulated by the minister. Um, so it, while, or, you know, the minister shall have the authority to establish and regulate or, you know, establish and govern um, distance learning opportunities or distance education, actually, is the term they tend to use. Uh, so for many of those jurisdictions beyond that single statement, there isn't much uh, there when it comes to distance learning. Now, BC and Nova Scotia are the exceptions to that. So uh, in British Columbia, and if folks have specific questions on this, uh, one of the nice things about having Randy in the room is that uh, he was actually involved in the ministry when a lot of these things came through. But um, there's a couple of sections in the Schools Act, uh, 3.1 and 75, and then there's a section 8.1 uh, in the Independent Schools Act that actually lay out a very structured uh, regulatory regime, and mainly a funding regime, although there's other things tied to that um, in the legislation. And in the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually the collective agreement that gets signed between the government of Nova Scotia and the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, which obviously has to be passed by the, the legislature. So um, that's where they've got a, a full section in that document that focuses upon, uh, if I remember correctly, there's 14 or 16 different clauses that focus upon uh, distance learning in that province. Um, so if you assume that really of those nine or 10 references there to legislation, there's really only two that have meaningful legislation. Um, it's the policy handbooks that tend to be the most common form of, of regulation. And for those of you that are veterans of this work, um, this is actually quite consistent uh, from year to year with the exception of one jurisdiction. Um, Quebec has actually passed an amendment to their, um, their Public Schools Act, which is uh, somewhat interesting. Essentially, um, what they have done is they uh, allow now, under the new legislation, for uh, pilot programs to be in, set up to test various distance education options. Um, now, as it stands right now, there hasn't been any or as of the time we published the report, which would have been late in the fall, actually, we would have stopped writing probably about the 19th of December, um, there had been no programs that had applied to the ministry to become part of one of these pilot projects. But the amendment that has allowed for them is quite interesting because if you go back in history, that's actually how many jurisdictions started to create some of the more um, interesting developments that they've had. And I referenced the, the Manitoba uh, pilot with the virtual collegiates as one of the more recent examples of that. Um, so for those of you that are veterans of this particular session, uh, that really is the only change in this from the previous year. So looking at the activity, um, as you can see, there is some activity happening in every province, but the level of activity from province to province varies significantly. So about one in 20 students across the country are involved in distance or online learning. Um, but as you can see in places like Nunavut and Prince Edward Island, and for that matter, even uh, Northwest Territories and, and, and Newfoundland, 
um, and those that fall under the federal jurisdiction, it, that number is more like one out of every 50 or even one out of every thousand in the case of uh, PEI and, and uh, Nunavut. Whereas if you look at jurisdictions like Alberta and BC, you're looking at basically one out of every 10 students are engaged in um, some form of, of distance or online learning. So you really kind of have two extremes with Alberta and BC really always being significantly higher than the national average. Um, you have basically New Brunswick, Ontario, Manitoba and Saskatchewan that are usually close to the national average and then you have everyone else that really are quite below the national average uh, when you're looking at this. And this has really been a, a consistent uh, look across the country. So, um, and the numbers involved in online and distance education have really sort of leveled off. So if you look at, you know, the historical record that we've got, uh, the first time anyone ever mentioned um, involvement in distance education across the country was actually a report that the Canadian Teachers Federation put out in 2000 uh, that estimated that there was about 25,000 students across the country, which would have been about half a percent of the, the students in all of Canada. When we started doing this study, we estimated at the time that there was about two and a half percent. And really, since 2012, 2013, so the last six years, it's always been 5% something. Um, 2014, 2015 was 6%, but 6.0. So really it's, you know, 5 point something, because I view that as 5.10, uh, um, if you think about it. So, um, uh, but, you know, the, the numbers really have, have leveled off. And some people have sort of asked about the fact that if you look at it from 2014-15 onwards, we've seen a consistent drop of about 15 to 20,000 people, uh, 20,000 students each year. And um, that, I think, is, is less to do with fewer students actually engaged in this and more to do with better record keeping. Um, so you'll notice that the first year we did this, we had a tilde in front of the, the number because we indicated that it was an approximate. And then the second year, we actually put in a range um, because there was such a wide variation between what we thought the upper and lower limits were. But even then, that was an estimate. From 2010 onward, you'll notice that we have put in a very specific number. But that number hasn't been as specific as what it appears sort of on this chart. Um, in many cases, those numbers do end up being um, estimates. Some jurisdictions are very good. Um, I can contact them tomorrow and they can tell me that there are this many students enrolled in this many courses. And um, of that, these students are only taking a single course, whereas these students are taking two courses and these students are taking three courses and so on. Um, you know, here's the breakdown by male and female. For that matter, here's the breakdown by course. Here's the breakdown by subject area. And then there are some that say, well, two years ago, we can tell you that there were approximately this number. And, um, you know, because of that, we, we get that kind of variation. And if you just look at the last three years as an example, you know, when you look at it on a province by province basis, you'll see that there are a lot of tildes on that, you know, in this table. Um, and those, for the most part, are the jurisdictions where um, we just don't get good data on a regular basis. Um, so you can see, as an example, historically in Alberta, it has been an estimate, although, and I'm glad that Daylene is in the audience because the first, I'm going to say five or six times I've done this presentation for Dan and Cider, I was always able to point to Alberta as an example of ones that I thought were moving in a, um, in a, well, I'll, I'll say a negative direction when it came to the ability to know what was going on in the distance uh, and online environment in their jurisdiction. Over the past three years, I can actually say the exact opposite. Um, when it comes to trying to get a handle on what is happening, how to foster, and how to improve their distance and online learning environment within the, the province, um, Alberta is actually one of the ones, and I, I say this when Daylene's not in the room, um, one of the ones that I think is, is a model that could be followed now because 
I, I see such drastic improvements over the past three years than I did the first, I guess, eight that we were doing this study. Um, and, you know, so, but as you look at the, the, the chart here, um, not only can you see sort of the, the difference in some of the individual provinces, so um, the difference, for example, from 2016-17 to 17-18, when you look at the overall total, is almost accounted for the, the 9,000 student drop that we see in Ontario. That may or may not be an, an actual 9,000 student drop because Ontario is one of those jurisdictions that um, if I were to ask them today what, you know, how many students were actually engaged in e-learning, they would be able to give me the, the data from two school years ago. And even then it would be what they would consider a best estimate. They wouldn't be able to provide an exact number um, at that stage. So, um, you know, that is a good example of a jurisdiction where you see the numbers will vary widely. Quebec is another good example of that because it's not done at the ministry level. So uh, what we learn about them is largely based upon uh, what we uh, are able to find from the individual program surveys. So uh, that accounts for much of that variation. Um, three years ago, we started looking at the blended learning activity, and that was when we rebranded the report from online learning to e-learning. Um, now, when I say that we are doing estimates when it comes to the online activity, the blended activity really, uh, it, it is just a best guess. Um, or in some cases, actually, the number that has the opportunity to engage in this. So as you look, this is the numbers that we've got for uh, this past school year, so from the 17-18 uh, school year. If you compare that over the last three years, and I wanted to move to this one a little bit more quickly because you can see the asterisks on the bottom and how they're associated with the ones up top. Um, so every single jurisdiction that we've got there either has no data or has asterisk data. Um, so, you know, it's either estimates or the ministry gave us a number and they hope that it's right or based upon the individual program responses, um, those are, um, you know, that's just adding up those. Um, I'm not sure Randy will be able to answer this one, so I will answer Linda's question in the thing. Um, how do you define blended learning? We actually let the ministries do that. So um, we don't, um, from a report perspective, we do have a, it's about a seven or eight page document on the report and Randy's gonna put it in the text there that goes through and talks about how we understand it from a literature perspective. But when we send out the surveys to the ministries, to the individual programs, we just use the term blended learning and let them define how they are operationalizing it. Um, based upon the, the data that we've got here, I can tell you that um, many of the jurisdictions, essentially all of the jurisdictions that have a single asterisk by their name, so Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and Ontario, um, what they are looking at is essentially um, the number of students that are enrolled in the provincial learning management system. So this is actually the number of students that would have the opportunity, assuming that they're teachers are actually using it with them. So as an example, I could request an account for all of my students in the provincial learning management system and ask the our local TELC if I was in Ontario to load up these six courses into my, into my account and have all the students in there. The ministry can track all of that, but they can't track how much the teacher or even if the teacher is using it with their students, if they're requiring it or if it's just something that the students can access on their own, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so because of that, in many of these cases, you know, these are really just best guesses uh, with it to, as a way of giving you some sense as to what might be happening on this front. Um, so uh, that's sort of a, a sense as to, um, you know, what's happening across the country and uh, any specific changes we've noticed over the past year. 
Uh, I'm looking up at the clock and I've been going for uh, 27 minutes now. And I said I wanted the 20 to 30 minute mark. So I'm going to uh, close out about there. Just a reminder that you can access all of this material uh, as well as anything else that uh, we've been doing on this front, um, including Randy, for example, led a book chapter in the recent handbook and um, of research into K-12 online and blended learning that you can find in the publications and presentations. Uh, Dan mentioned that the slides would be on the CIDR site. They're also under the publications and presentations section of uh, our website, and we'll have a link to the recording there as well. Um, so I'm going to stop right there now. And um, Randy, if you could let me know if there were any questions in the chat box that you think I should revisit to start with. Otherwise, I'll just open it up in general for questions. And you can feel free to type it in the chat box or grab the mic and ask us that way. Sure. Yeah, sorry. We've had a, a pretty engaging text conversation. And I know when you're presenting, you can't follow it. So. Uh, there, there were a couple, and I think maybe just going backwards, uh, Daylene, you asked about why it would be important to collect data on blended learning, and there was some post and discussion about, um, you know, in my dream world, the shifting practice towards blended and integrated learning options that are irrespective of physical or virtual, uh, that it's, it is that mashup that occurs, uh, whether it be situated in a classroom or situated at a distance. Uh, but it is really practice. Is that's what's driving uh, the policy and funding changes that are ongoing? I, I would love to say yes, it is. But it also, I think to bring it back daily to your question, I think that's why it's important to try to collect data on blended learning, but not specifically blended uh, by the definition. I think it's on all of the innovative practices and changes that are occurring in K-12 to to the best of their ability. It's a very sort of structured system, but it's less structured right now in BC and Alberta, certainly in Saskatchewan as well, more structured where there's centralized programs. So looking at practices there, I think are really, really important. So Daily, do you want to just maybe add to that my comments there? The mic, Dalian, you do have access to it if you want to add more or just text quickly, but I'll speak faster than you can. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, it's just a curiosity. You know, um, Michael and Randy, We, a lot of us have been at Blend Ed over the years, and the question just comes up around you know, should we or shouldn't we define it, define blended teaching and learning? And we've heard clearly from the field that that would, you know, certainly box, feel, feel like it might be boxing some folks in rather than allowing some of that innovative practices to to bloom and, and allowing that flexibility for teachers to explore different ways to meet their student learning needs. So, you know, we're really, um, we've really done a, a significant focus on using our data to inform for example, our guides that were recently released and also to inform the continuous improvement process. So if it was thought that blended teaching and learning, um, you know, if we were able to somehow capture that information in whatever way it is, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, and, and feel confident in saying, you know, this is how it's improving student outcomes, I think that's that's data that's, you know, that I would think is, is worth collecting for sure. And I think one of the advantages of collecting it, even in the sort of mishmash way that we do, is as you look at those charts to see what jurisdictions are doing things, at least then folks in the field have the ability to say that it directs them somewhere, essentially. So if you see a, a, a jurisdiction where most of our data comes from the individual program surveys. You can go to that jurisdictional page and the survey responses are all listed there. So you can see, okay, this pro, you know, program A and program D and program uh, M are all doing something with blended learning. Let me reach out to them to see A, how they're defining it, and B, what are they exactly doing? Um, you know, and those were the ministries providing data. Let me, you know, contact, you know, 
with someone in the ministry there and find out exactly what it is they're doing or not doing, depending upon the numbers that are there. So even though it's sort of a very nebulous thing that we are reporting there, it allows folks that are interested in those areas leads in terms of individual programs or individual jurisdictions that they can then reach out to to find out, you know, what's happening there. Yeah, Randy here, and I'm going to chime in on, on the, the definition thing with a little bit of the biases that I have. In education, as soon as we define something, we put it in a box and it's dismissed. Um, I think that, that uh, however, the, the, the practices of working and engaging in digital learning environments uh, that teachers have embraced in many cases um, are, are not well known or well understood. So bringing light to the description of the practices, I think, is really important. Um, and the, the, the horn and stake are kind of in a box. You only have four choices of blended learning, I think, does a disservice to the creativity in, and uh, innovation. We know that you put a good teacher in any learning environment with students, uh, and they'll be creative. I think what's important in a system, an education system, is that we support and enable that creativity to occur. Um, but then that's my rose-colored glasses speaking. Uh, but certainly for Alberta, uh, Daleen, it's important to give a description, a rich description of the kind of learning activities that are occurring uh, so that those are stuck in the brick and mortar um, uh, era, shall we say, uh, have a better understanding about how digital learning environments can be leveraged to facilitate better and more meaningful learning and engagement and enable different uh, pedagogical practices to come into play uh, in a curriculum driven system. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, we have to be careful that we don't get too boxed in in a definition about what something is or isn't because it's a shifting and changing thing as well. Fair enough. And, and I know that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to prep Kevin and say, you know, with some experience in working in adult learning situations, et cetera, et cetera, some differences around K-12 and post-sec. If that comes into the conversation, that would be nice uh, as well. But I, I, to me, there's a couple of things that always driven. In the research that I did in BT, I remember sitting down with a deputy minister and saying, okay, which is it? Does practice drive policy or does policy drive practice? And the wise answer was, well, it's both. Um, so from that point uh, right now, I know that I made mention of the BC funding review, uh, which before in terms of BC's, and, and as Michael pointed out, uh, the um, penetration of online learning activities in, in British Columbia has been probably one of the, the most deepest and most robust. But the involvement in uh, the learning management systems uh, and in the resources and courses that are developed in Ontario or certainly in the Anglophone, but also to a certain extent in the Francophone uh, boards as well, is very rich relative to, to other jurisdictions. So resourcing, regulation, uh, and funding all drive practice uh, within that. But overall, despite uh, those individual factors in the silos called the different ministries in the provinces, um, there still is an emerging trend towards the integration of digital learning tools, resources and environments into both classroom based but as well as a transition from those totally virtual schools to integrating more practice in face-to-face -face environments including in communities is where a lot of education is shifting um, and curriculum and policy decisions around uh, a move towards competency-based learning uh, as well have supported the ability to create that kind of a pedagogical and learning approach. So that to me is what's more consistent across in practice. Um, and I think that unfortunately um, is that I don't believe right now, and Michael correct me if you have a different impression, I don't believe necessarily that the ministries of education are driving this practice forward. I think that they're trying to respond and react to how they, the definitions for funding uh, and how they count for the learning activities uh, uh, this innovative, this changing practices are trying to be rationalized within a government structure and funding structure. On a funding perspective, I'd agree 100%. I do think there are a couple of jurisdictions that are trying to, um, that are trying to lead the practice as opposed to respond to the practice. But 
it's more in terms of the environment that they're creating to encourage what's happening. Um, but when it comes to funding, yeah, every jurisdictions are, are those that are choosing to engage in it are in a reactive mode. And um, this, this is also one of those areas where our proximity to the United States hasn't done us any favors. You know, if you look at the um, just the, the field of educational technology in general, particularly as it relates to the K-12 environment. Um, throughout the 80s and the 90s, and even the early part of the, 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 the new millennium, um, we had a much more European perspective on this. If you look at you know, government policies throughout many of the provinces and, and referred to this sector as distributed learning, and some still do at the federal level, uh, things, you know, particularly when it comes to what we now call blended learning, were uh, lumped together in this information communications technology realm. Um, if you look in uh, you know, the a, a lot of the Asians and the uh, Australia, New Zealand were in a similar boat, but instead of using ICT, they used just the generalized term e-learning. And when you looked at the ICT or e-learning definitions, it really ran the, the gamut from on the low end, that teacher that uses you know the overhead projector in his or her classroom uh, with the students to uh, classes that were being taught entirely at a distance and leveraging technology in weird and wonderful ways. And there was a spectrum that you know you fell on somewhere in between that. And, and what we now refer to as blended learning was somewhere, you know, not necessarily the middle, but somewhere in between those two points. Um, and then, unfortunately, um, you know, in, in the U.S., this, this notion of blended learning um, began to get tied up within a corporatized version of education and really was pushed by organizations that um, were looking at the, the privatization of public education. And um, for one reason or another, um, both research and policy in Canada decided to, you know, get in line with an American model instead of the more international perspective that we had previous to that. Um, and I, I think that's been um, good in some ways because it allows, you know, the Blend Ed Conference is a good example of this, but it allows some promotion of a what people think is a specific idea, even if no one can agree upon what that idea actually is. Um, but at the same time, it leads to conversations like the one we've been having for the last 12 minutes now. And we're still on it because I haven't seen any new questions come through the, the chat. And um, were there any others that we missed along the way there, Randy, or that we should revisit? Uh, or does anyone else want um, to grab the mic? Well, I, well I, I'm, I'm going to prompt a few people, but if no one's going to speak. <laughs> um, I'm curious, and, and Jean, I'm wondering, and Daylene, I'm wondering, uh, if you can speak a little bit to the changes that Alberta has initiated over the past couple of years um, with specifically regarding uh, sort of what was distance education because there was a lot of um, uh, consideration of the current the, the model that existed in the Alberta Distance Learning Center and CFED in terms of uh, being a government initiated and run um, provincial program to fill in those gaps around in rural certainly has always been a, a key driver but ADLC uh, in a funding a few years ago uh, there was some additional funding that went into the system, which then spurred a lot of different practices. And since the funding uh, model was changed in Alberta, ADLC is now, I would say, whether it's correct or not, please correct me, collapsed back into what it traditionally started with was a program simply run out of Barhead for the province. Uh, and the districts have picked up on those practices. So. Uh, now, blended learning has become sort of a, a, an important uh, emergent piece in Alberta. And uh, Daylene, you've been working on at the Alberta Ministry, edu Alberta Education, to um, 
try to rationalize that, hence the questions around definition. But I'm wondering if you and Jean maybe could just speak a little bit about both from policy legislation provincially and if from a practitioner's point of view, um, how that is is. on the spot, I'm sorry if you're still there. I think it, it becomes an important part. Uh, okay, thank, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's an important piece to study, I think, in terms of looking at what's going on in each of the provinces to a certain extent. Uh, and I know that in British Columbia, there's very strong concern that, uh, and a lot of people are the harbinger of distributed learning in BC is dead. If uh, they go to a per course funding, it's going to uh, severely impact a lot of programs because there is cross enrollment that exists in British Columbia and it is supported through funding. Now, is the funding driving that practice or has the practice been uh, manifested in that resulting funding? Those discussions are going on right now in BC and it'll be interesting to see where they go in Alberta. Um, because the, the, the per uh, course unit funding is um, allows for some flexibility within each jurisdiction to support uh, learning programs. Uh, I think that that has a potential for a lot more flexibility. In Ontario, it's pretty much uh, lockstep. And where, where school districts build flexibility is through three very uh, critical and dominant consortia that the school districts uh, use to create the flexibility to allow for uh, changes outside of, of jurisdictions. When you go and look at the Atlantic provinces, they're driven by a provincial uh, initiative and a provincial program. So innovation changes and modifications can occur within there because the funder is actually operating in the practice. Uh, where there is a uh, distinction between the funder and the practice is where you have these creative differences that do occur, uh, but they all uh, have an impact on their, the, the programs uh, across. And it'll be interesting to see, Michael, you know, certainly with the, with the development of Aurora Virtual in Yukon and Beaufort Delta in Northwest Territories, that uh, those as well will change some of the practices that are occurring in those areas. So uh, it's evolving and certainly not the same as when you started uh, what's happening in the state of Do you want to address Pam's question? Sorry, I was scrolling back through the chat to see. Um, I was trying to type out a, a response to another question I saw. Um, let's see. I'm curious about um, that's actually a very interesting question, Pam, and it's not something we've collected uh, data on from the state of the nation. Now, I can tell you based on my own research uh, that I've done with other colleagues. Um, and I'll, I'll fully admit that it's been solely focused upon Newfoundland as a jurisdiction, uh, folks that I've been working on, uh, that I've been working with back at Memorial University. But um, one of the difficulties historically had been that many of these distance and the online programs have tended to focus primarily up on either the advanced level curriculum or at best the academic curriculum. So in many cases they aren't offering, um, you know, going back to the days of streaming, a basic curriculum or credit recovery or things that would be more of interest to your students that are less academically inclined. Um, and one of the things uh, that, you know, so um, just based upon that alone, if you've got a distance program that really is only offering, you know, advanced placement courses and high levels math and sciences and foreign languages, you're limiting your potential student base right off the bat. Um, and I think that has been what we've seen historically in a lot of those um, jurisdictions. The other thing that we saw and it was actually based on a study that uh, Dennis Mulcahy did that I helped um, just get, essentially get published. Um, he did a study of uh, schools along coastal Labrador. Um, so 
these were all very isolated communities. Um, most of them were, um, you know, the school was located in a single community and it was only that community that catered to that school. Uh, so students couldn't be bused in or boated in, if you will, um, from other jurisdictions. And it was fascinating because in that particular study, what he found was both students and the parents uh, preferred to take their studies from a teacher that was actually in the building there, even if the teacher, A, had no academic background in the topic. Um, and B, if it meant taking a lower curriculum. So in the case of, 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 of Newfoundland, and again, this was in coastal Labrador, so that's where it was located. Um, Newfoundland, for example, still has like uh, ad, ad, uh, sorry, advanced math courses. They still have uh, regular math courses, and they still have a basic math curriculum. They also have a regular English curriculum, and they have a basic English curriculum. The distance ed program only offers the regular program and the advanced program. They don't offer any of the basic courses. But what Dennis found was that there were students that were academically capable to do the academic curriculum, you know, the regular curriculum. These were students that, you know, not A students, but students that would get 60s and 70s and still pass and do fine in the regular curriculum. And by passing the regular curriculum would then be eligible to go on to you know, one of the colleges or universities in, in the province or in the region. Um, but because the only way to do the academic curriculum was to do it through the virtual school, the students were consciously making the decision to take the basic courses, which essentially meant that the best that they could do with their academic future was a two-year um, college or trade school. And only because that way they would be able to take the course from a teacher that was actually in the building. Um, you know, so they were giving up on their educational futures to be able to essentially take a course from the guy that was there, the gal that was there, as opposed to taking it online. Um, so, and again, that's just a single study in a single jurisdiction, but it was something that, uh, you know, it was the first time it had been brought up in the literature, and I thought it was a, a fascinating thing. Um, you know, that sense of community that exists in rural Newfoundland um, basically outweighed all of the other aspects that, um, you know, these students were considering. Okay, I just uh, asked if Connie wanted to chime in because she also mentioned and brought up the rural urban issues and I see Pam is, is typing as well. So um, just let us know, you can feel free to grab the mic while we have the mics open. It's not, uh, we're not trying to be exclusive here. So I'm also looking at the time in terms of this uh so michael do you want to why don't we close off on this rural urban piece i'll let turn the mic over or the commentary over to Pam. well let's hope that maybe connie you can come up with, with the graduate student that can do that level of uh, depth of research in there because uh, unfortunately there is no easy data to to bring forward. There would have to be some comparative data that would be uh, put together and analyzed, I believe, to make that happen. Michael, would you agree? Yes, very much so. Um, with the exception of a couple of jurisdictions, Newfoundland and BC being probably the two exceptions um, where the ministries do have a very um, specific and granular set of data that they provide. Just about every other jurisdiction, um, if you can get data at the provincial level, it is very, it's just a single data point. Um, to really get that fine level of data, it would require interaction with um, many of the um, individual programs that you were specifically focused upon 
to get essentially data right out of their um, um, their uh, student information systems. Uh, Kevin, yes, it is available. Um, if you send me an email, and actually this is a good time to um, punch up my information here. Um, and Randy, I don't have one for you, so thank you. I just noticed you stuck it in the chat window there, so Randy's email is in the chat. Um, if you send me an email, Kevin, I can send you uh, a link to the article that was published. I'm not sure if I still have a copy of the full report, because um, if I remember correctly, they had a Harris, a small Harris Center grant, and that was where they produced this 60, 70 page report, and then I worked with them to get it down to a journal article, which I've got somewhere on my website, um, so I can send it directly. Um, we're at the top of the hour there, so I'll turn it over to Dan to formally close the session, but Randy and I can hang out for a bit afterwards if other folks have questions. Sure, that's great. And uh, thank you. That's Michael Barber and Randy Labonte on the 2017-18 uh, State of the Union, State of the Nation uh, report, available at k12sotn.ca. And you'll also find it posted on our site, cider.athabascu.ca, along with the slides and a full uh, recording of today's presentation will be posted there in about an hour. And yes, uh, we can hang out for a little bit longer. If anybody has any questions, we'll bring the formal presentation to an end here. Uh, I've just been letting you two uh, run with it, and it's been going great. So thank you once again, and thank you to our audience as well. <laughs>